protest public health measures and disrupt vaccine appointments. But here's the thing. The reason so many Canadians are following public health measures isn't just because they want things to get back to normal. It's because they care about their neighbours and about our frontline workers. It's because they know people who are vulnerable, people who could die if this virus keeps spreading. These protests are supposed to be about getting back to normal, but by spreading the virus, they do just the opposite and prolong lockdowns. So follow public health advice, but don't do it for me or for any politician. Do it for someone in your life that you care about. Do it because you respect your fellow Canadians. To the millions of people who are already doing this and who are stepping up to look out for those around you, Thank you. As you do your as you do uh, your part, know that we have your back. Across the country, we're deploying additional support to provinces and territories that have been hit hardest by this third wave. For Alberta, we continue reaching out to the province through the weekend. We're offering whatever help they need to get the situation under control and keep Albertans safe. For the GTA, the second team of healthcare workers from Newfoundland and Labrador will arrive at Pearson this afternoon on board a Canadian Armed Forces airplane. They'll join the first team that's already there, as well as the Armed Forces members who are helping in Toronto hospitals. And for all Canadians, we continue to deliver PPE, rapid tests, and of course, vaccines. We have now delivered 16.8 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines to the provinces and territories. This week, just like every week in May, we're receiving 2 million doses from Pfizer alone. Already 1.3 million doses of this week's shipment have been delivered to the provinces and territories. For Moderna, we're picking up our next shipment tonight in Europe, and by tomorrow morning, a million Moderna doses will be on the ground in Canada. Almost all of these doses will arrive in provinces and territories by the end of the week. In total, more than 3 million vaccine doses will be delivered this week. Every day, more and more people are being vaccinated. Every dose allows to protect another person. Every dose is a step towards the end of this pandemic. All vaccines in Canada have been approved by Health Canada. Our advice to provinces and territories and to Canadians has not changed. Dr. Tam will have more to say in a few minutes, but make sure you get your shot as soon as it's your turn. Already we're seeing how vaccines, along with public health measures, keep people safe. We've administered hundreds of thousands of vaccine doses in hundreds of Indigenous communities. Cases are now falling quickly in places across the country. In fact, for First Nations communities alone, active cases are about a sixth of what they were at the end of January. This is not a coincidence. Vaccines work. From day one, our top priority has been keeping people safe. And as long as this crisis lasts, that remains job one. In Budget 2021, we laid out an additional $1.2 billion to finish the fight against COVID-19 for Indigenous communities. This will go towards everything from hiring nurses to getting PPE to the front lines. In Budget 2021, we also plan to invest more than half a billion dollars in a mental health and wellness strategy for First Nations, Inuit and the Métis. Mental health is just as important as other aspects of our health. Everyone deserves the care and the support that they need. In fact, at this, the beginning of Mental Health Week, I want to remind everyone that if you are having any problems, you're not alone. Ask for help. You can always consult the Wellness Together Canada website, which offers 24-7 access to resources and support. You can create uh, an account online, or you can call 1-866-585-0445. Once again, 1-866-585-0445. For Indigenous people, there is also the hope 
for Wellness Helpline, which offers help in several languages. To reach this line, call 1-855-242-3310 or visit Hope for Wellness Telephone. Later on today, Minister Miller will be meeting with communities in Quebec to discuss the ways in which we can ensure that everyone has a chance to be successful, particularly in ensuring that our children receive a quality education that is adapted to their culture. The goal is to listen to what communities need and to see how we can continue to advance together on the path to reconciliation. Have access to clean water, just like everyone should have a safe home and a good job. Together, we've made progress in the past five years. On drinking water alone, we've listed, lifted 106 long-term advisories since 2015. But if this pandemic has taught us anything, it's that there's always more work to do. That's why we're investing $6 billion for Indigenous infrastructure projects. Whether for roads or schools, this will close gaps that far too many people still face and support good jobs across the country. Together, we can and we will continue to move forward. Because of this pandemic, many people are depending more and more on wireless connections, whether it's for school, work, or to talk to their families. A cell package or Wi-Fi connection at home is no, not a luxury, it is a need. And this is something that everyone should be able to afford. In 2019, we promised to reduce costs for cell services by 25 percent also for Wi-Fi. Today, we've seen the most recent reports on average costs for packages for home and internet, and prices have gone down between 9 and 28 percent. That's encouraging news. We are on the right path. As we rebuild following this pandemic, we will try to always make life more affordable for the middle class. I want to recognize that May marks the start of both Asian Heritage Month and Canadian Jewish Heritage Month. As we celebrate the contributions of Asian Canadians and of the Jewish community alike, we have a lot to be thankful for. Because from dropping off groceries for neighbors to organizing PPE drives, in the last year, people have come together like never before. Truly, diversity is our strength. And it's something we must always stand up for. There is no place in Canada for anti-Semitism. There's no place for anti-Asian racism. There's no place for hatred or discrimination against anyone or any community. On est toujours. We are always stronger together today and every day. Thank you very much. And I will now give the floor to Minister Anand. Anita. Thank you, Prime Minister. Today, I will provide you with an update on vaccine deliveries into this country. On that, d'hier, as of yesterday, more than 16.8 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines have arrived in Canada. To date, the provinces and territories have administered more than 14 million of those doses. Nearly 34 percent of Canadians have received at least one dose. Each and every day, we are increasing our collective protection and advancing further down the path that will lead us out of the pandemic. Since the early days of our vaccine campaign, our government has been keeping Canadians up to date on our plans and progress. And when Moderna informed us that there would be delays while they worked to ramp up production, we shared that news as soon as we received it. Today, I am pleased to provide some good news on that front. The one million Moderna doses originally anticipated to be picked up next week have now been picked up, and they are en route to Canada and scheduled to arrive early tomorrow morning. I can also tell you that Moderna has been working with our department at PSPC to solidify a more regular schedule going forward. This week's Moderna shipment, combined with the 2 million 
doses arriving from Pfizer mean that a total of 3 million doses will be in Canada before the end of the week. And arrivals of the Pfizer vaccine continue to be on track for 2 million doses each week in May. That number ramps up to 2.4 million doses each week over five weeks in June. De plus en plus de more and more Canadians from across the country are now booking their appointments, bringing relief and hope to so many. And it is extremely encouraging to see that such an enthusiastic uptake of vaccines among Canadians. Now that the provinces and territories have been expanding the administration of vaccines to younger age groups and priority populations, we have even more to look forward to this spring. And all of our public health experts will tell you, we can't let down our guard. These next weeks and months are crucial as our vaccination campaign accelerates. We need to remain vigilant in our efforts to curb the spread of the virus and its more contagious variants. I would like to express my appreciation to all Canadians for observing the public health guidelines and keeping their own communities safe. As more vaccines arrive and more Canadians get their shot, please do your part and continue to follow these guidelines. For our government's part, we will continue our efforts to get vaccines into the country as quickly as possible. And we will not stop until every Canadian who wants a vaccine receives one. Thank you. And now I think uh, Minister, Minister Miller. Miller. Thank you, Minister Nand. Hello et bonjour. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am on the traditional territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. I'd like first of all to emphasize that this week is Mental Health Week. The COVID-19 pandemic has had deep repercussions on the mental health and well-being of Indigenous peoples and it has emphasized existing inequalities in terms of health care and mental health care especially and has created new needs. Mental wellness is by talking about it. Speak out about it. Speak out about how you're feeling. Reach out to friends, families and elders. And if you need help, there are people to support you. The Hope for Wellness line is there for everyone. First Nations, Inuit, Métis, children, youth or adults. As the Prime Minister said, you can reach them by calling one 855 242 3310 or connect to an online chat of hopeforwellness.ca. Telephone counseling is also available in Cree, Ojibwe, and Inuktitut. I'd like to give you an update on the case numbers and vaccines rolled out in First Nations and Inuit communities. On that du 3 mai, as of May 3rd, in First Nations communities on reserves, we are aware of 771 active cases, which brings us to a total of 25,000 and some cases of COVID-19. So 26,000 cases of recovery and uh, tragically 390 some deaths. What we've seen in Quebec uh, as of the 4th of May, the government of Nunavut is talking about 85 active cases speaking with the government of Nunavut and Nunavut Tungavik Incorporated to provide significant financial support for food security and enhanced public health measures, among others. Indigenous communities are keeping up the fight against COVID-19. However, events in Iqaluit and alarming outbreaks in some communities are painful reminders to maintain public health measures. This is not over. Vaccinations remain our top defense against the virus. By prioritizing and vaccinating Indigenous communities first, We've managed to significantly decrease case counts and keep more Indigenous individuals healthy. As of April 30th, just shy of 370,000 doses have been administered in over 661 First Nations, Inuit and territorial communities. Of that, 107,596 were second doses. 
That means that over 59% of adults in First Nations communities, as well as over 72% of adults living in the territories, have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. In Inuit communities, this rate goes up to almost 80%, and the data is clear. The COVID-19 case rate has drastically slowed down as the number of vaccinated people increased. There are many successful examples uh, as we roll out vaccines across the country. 585 um, First Nations communities have vaccination programs underway. In Quebec, it has happened in all communities. In Kaknawagi, for example, they have wrapped up their vaccination campaign last week. And um, almost all of the elderly were vaccinated successfully. Communities. And as of April 27th, 53% of the populations aged 18 and older living on reserve had received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine at a rate that is over twice that of Alberta's. I'd also like to highlight the outstanding work done by the Blackfoot Confederacy in sharing vaccines to keep everyone safe. Despite the recent surge in cases in Alberta, active cases among First Nations in communities on reserve has totaled recently 223 active cases and is encouraging to see the support and partnerships in the vaccine rollout. The Canadian Armed Forces also continue to assist vaccination teams with the accelerated pace of immunization in a number of on-reserve Indigenous communities in northern Manitoba, among others. CAF has also been assisting provincial vaccination authorities with tasks associated with vaccine administration in more than 25 communities in the Anishinaabe Aski Nation in northern Ontario. This week in particular, CAF will be assisting in Wunumin and Pagangicum First Nation communities with the second dose of COVID-19. Miigwech, Nakumik, Marcy, thank you, et merci. Dr. Tam. Thank you very much. Um, bonjour à tous et à tous. Good morning to everyone. The world reach an amazing milestone of over 1 billion vaccines administered. And today, we'd we'll like to give a shout out to the millions of Canadians who have been stepping up to get vaccinated, and the many among them who are actively helping others by sharing credible information and assisting in other ways. But first, the numbers update. To date, over 1.2 million cases of COVID-19, including over 24,300 deaths, have been reported in Canada. We are making progress nationally, but there are still a few tricky spots. The decline in national case counts has slowed to a less than 2% decrease over the past week, with an average of 7,900 cases reported daily. Unfortunately, the number of people experiencing severe and critical illness remains high. Over the past week, an average of almost 4,300 people with COVID-19 were being treated in our hospitals each day, including over 1,450 people being treated in intensive care units. At the same time, an average of 47 deaths were reported daily. Yesterday, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization updated its recommendations on the use of COVID-19 vaccines to include advice on the use of the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. As with the AstraZeneca vaccine, there have been confirmed cases of very rare but serious blood clots associated with low levels of blood platelets, known as vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia, or VIT after administration of the Janssen vaccine. At this time, and based on current evidence, NACI recommends the Janssen vaccine may be offered to individuals 30 years of age and older without contraindications if the individual wants to receive a vaccine right away. The, inf the recommendations have been updated based on an assessment of the risk of it COVID-19 exposure risk and the potential benefit of earlier vaccination in preventing serious COVID-19 disease for various age groups. Provinces and territories are currently planning to add this additional tool to their toolbox to help end the pandemic as soon as possible. As we move through this rough period, we can be optimistic as vaccine supply expands and more and more Canadians roll up a sleeve. There is a real sense of hope and solidarity in the air. Recently, a Canadian collaborative movement has popped up 
with a dedicated website and hashtag aimed at getting more Canadians informed and motivated to get their shots. This is OurShot.ca is rallying Canadians across the country to encourage each other to replace vaccine hesitancy with confidence so that we can end the pandemic together. They have partnered with task forces and doctors serving racialized and ethnic communities across Canada to address their questions and concerns by making information more accessible, including by offering resources in 28 different languages, from Amharic to Vietnamese. Initiatives like these can inspire all of us to join the challenge that will help spread the message that by getting vaccinated, we're taking action to end the COVID-19 pandemic in Canada. But let's not forget, there are also other things we all need to be doing to keep ourselves, our loved ones and our communities safer. Regardless of our vaccination status, we all need to continue following public health advice and maintain individual wash, mask, space practices, even as we're beginning to see the positive impacts of COVID-19 vaccines. This May the 4th, this is May the 4th, and during the month of May, Canada's vaccine supplies are expanding. So May the 4th of immunity be with you. Thank you. Bonjour à et à tous. Good morning, everyone. Last week, the world reached an amazing milestone of over 1 billion vaccines administered. And today, we'd like to give a shout out to the millions of Canadians who have been stepping up to get vaccinated and the many among them who are actively helping others by sharing credible information and assisting in other ways. But first, the numbers update. To date, over 1.2 million cases of COVID-19, including over 24,300 deaths, have been reported in Canada. We are making progress nationally, but there are still a few tricky spots. The decline in national case counts has slowed to less than 2% decrease over the past week, with an average of 7,900 cases reported daily. Unfortunately, the number of people experiencing severe and critical illness remains high. Over the past week, an average of almost 4,300 people with COVID-19 were being treated in our hospitals each day including over 1,450 people being treated in intensive care units. At the same time, an average of 47 deaths were reported daily. Yesterday, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, or NACI, updated its recommendations on the use of COVID-19 vaccines to include advice on the use of the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. As with the AstraZeneca vaccine, there have been confirmed cases of very rare but serious blood clots associated with low levels of blood platelets, known as vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia, or VIT, after administration of the Janssen vaccine. At this time, and based on current evidence, NASI recommends that the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine may be offered to individuals 30 years of age and older without contraindications if the individual wants to receive a vaccine right away. The recommendations have been updated based on an assessment of the risk of VIT, COVID-19 exposure risk, and the potential benefits of early vaccination in preventing serious COVID-19 disease for various age groups. Provinces and territories are planning to add this additional tool to their toolbox to help end the pandemic as soon as possible. As we move through this rough period, we can be optimistic. As vaccine supply expands and more and more Canadians roll up a sleeve, there is a real sense of hope and solidarity in the air. Recently, a Canadian collaborative movement has popped up with a dedicated website and hashtag aimed at getting more Canadians informed and motivated to get their shots. This is our shot.ca is rallying Canadians across the country to encourage each other to replace vaccine hesitancy with confidence so that we can end the pandemic together. They have partnered with task forces and doctors 
serving racialized and ethnic communities across Canada to address their questions and concerns by making information more accessible, including by offering resources in 28 different languages, from Amharic to Vietnamese. Initiatives like these can inspire all of us to join the challenge that will help spread the message that, by getting vaccinated, we're taking action to end the COVID-19 pandemic in Canada. But let's not forget uh, there are also other things we all need to do to keep ourselves, our loved ones and our communities safe. Regardless of our vaccination status, we all need to continue following public health advice and maintain individual wash, mask, space practices, even as we're beginning to see the positive impacts of COVID-19 vaccines. This May the 4th and during the month of May, Canada's vaccine supplies are expanding. May the 4th of immunity be with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. New. We'll now turn to questions on the phone. The Prime Minister will be around for a number of questions from the phone in the room, and then the ministers and doctors will still be available after that. Operator, over to you. Thank you, merci. You may press star one if you have a question. You can appuy sur étoile one if you have a question. La première question de Lina Dib, de la presse canadienne. La parole est à vous. Oui, bonjour. Good morning, Mr. Trudeau. I'd like to ask you about uh, uh, vaccine passports for international travel. I'd like to know if the American administration has said what they think of this. I know that they're not um, very fond of the idea of having passports, vaccine passports to go to restaurants, etc. But what do you, th do you, do you know what they think about this for international travel? And have they shared that with you? Thank you, Lena, uh, the answer. Uh, first of all, let me reiterate that uh, this is not the time to travel. We haven't reached that point yet. We're hoping to get to that in the coming months. But for the moment, we need to limit our movements and follow public health guidelines and instructions. We have to be vaccinated as quickly as possible. Every country in the world can put forward principles or expectations that they have so that people may be able to travel there. Some countries uh, require vaccinations for yellow fever and cholera or other um, illnesses. But uh, for us and European countries as well, we're looking at uh, the question of vaccine certificates as to whether they'd be useful or necessary to, in order to travel once we are through the pandemic. Obviously, every country will take its own decisions, but we are interested in aligning with the countries that would like to do so, because we know that ensuring the protection of Canadians must be our primary concern. But I can't speak for the United States and the decisions that they may be taking in terms of people visiting their country. So you say you can't speak for the States. Well, just a moment. i just repeat it in English. Let me begin by saying, first of all, that now is not the time to travel. Uh, we are all hopeful we're going to be able to get back to normal in the coming months uh, and start traveling again. Uh, but the reality is we're not there yet. We're still very much in a third wave. We still need uh, to get more and more people vaccinated across this country and get those numbers down. However, uh, we also know that uh, as people start to travel again, perhaps this summer, if everything goes well, um, it would make sense for us to align with partners around the world on uh, some sort of proof of vaccination or vaccine certification. Uh, we are now working with uh, allies, particularly in Europe, on that. Uh, but ultimately, it is up to every country to determine what requirements they expect from uh, incoming travelers. Uh, we are looking very carefully at it, hoping to align uh, with uh, allied countries, but I can't speak for the United States and the choices they might make uh, around who to welcome uh, into their country. Ms. Vivi, Oui, merci. Thank you. You say that you cannot speak for the states, but there are our neighbors, and the most travel is between our two countries. So are you saying that Canada may require a proof of vaccination from Americans as they cross the border when the Americans are not going to necessarily require one of us? Answer. Well, we have seen from the outset that we 
are trying to align ourselves with our um, partners, particularly the United States. Uh, that's what we've done on, with the land border from the outset. And ideally speaking, we would have similar measures. But our responsibility is to do everything necessary to protect Canadians. And we are going to do that even if there isn't automatically symmetry with other countries. We will continue to um, make that our absolute priority, the protection of people in our country. Thank you. Thank you, merci. The next question is from Charlie Pinkerton from iPolitics. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, Prime Minister, tomorrow at a meeting of the World Trade Organization's General Counsel, a month-old request from India and South Africa to waive uh, some patent protections to allow poorer countries early, easier access to COVID-19 vaccines will again be discussed. Um, would Canada vote in favor of this waiver? Should it come to it? Uh, Canada well understands, Charlie, that this uh, pandemic isn't over anywhere until it's over everywhere. Uh, and that's why at the WTO, uh, at, uh, uh, with the WHO, uh, with various partners around the world, we continue to work to ensure, uh, including through COVAX and the App Accelerator, uh, that there are vaccines uh, available for people all around the world as quickly and in as large quantities as possible. I know the conversations around uh, patent uh, protections are ongoing and Canada is uh, actively participating in them, but we understand how important it is to get vaccines to the most vulnerable around the world, and we will keep working for that. A follow-up, Charlie? Uh, yeah, I, I would appreciate a more firm answer on whether or not Canada would support this, but I, I suppose uh, a follow-up question would be, would vaccine passports be something that your government would be willing um, to create ahead of the time that everyone has access to vaccines, so before the time um, that uh, everyone's had a chance uh, to get two shots. As I've said, uh, every step of the way, we're going to make sure we're doing everything we can to keep Canadians safe. Uh, and that means following science, uh, listening to experts on recommendations they're making. We know uh, that vaccination is a really important part of how we get through this uh, for the long term. Uh, and that is uh, going to be something we're continuing Canadians uh, to do. We need to make sure that uh, access is equitable. We're happy uh, to be highlighting today the tremendously successful uh, vaccination campaigns that have been taking place uh, in Indigenous communities across the country with uh, full partnership of Indigenous uh, leadership. Uh, these are the kinds of things we need to make sure that we're doing uh, so that any steps we take moving forward are fair for everyone. Uh, but yes, as I said, we are looking at uh, requirements around vaccination on international travel, uh, and we will, as much as possible, align with uh, partners and uh, allies on these issues. Thank you. And we'll take one more question on the phone. Operator. The next question is from Ryan Timelty from the National Post. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning, sir. Um, I'm sure you know NASI yesterday recommended that people who can wait uh, for an mRNA vaccine uh, should pass on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine um, uh, because of the risk of blood clots. Um, I'm wondering if you're concerned that that recommendation is going to slow Canada's vaccine rollout um, and further muddle the waters and create more vaccine hesitancy. I think first and foremost, Ryan, uh, I have heard and you have heard and we have all heard directly uh, from friends, loved ones, Canadians in general, how eager everyone is to get through this, get back to normal, get to a better summer, end with this, end this pandemic uh, once and for all. Uh, everyone wants that and we know the way to do that is to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. Uh, the uh, longer we wait, the longer it takes um, the slower uh, before we get back to normal, the slower before we get to drive down case numbers across the country. So everyone knows uh, that we need to get our shots uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, and uh, I can reinforce once again that every single vaccine available in Canada 
has been approved by Health Canada as being both safe and effective. Uh, it is a good thing that we get to hear from a broad range of medical experts and doctors uh, making recommendations to keep us safe. The bottom line is we need to all of us get vaccinated as quickly as possible so we can get back to normal. But I will uh, turn to uh, Dr. Tam for a follow up on the medical aspects of that question. Teresa. Yes, thank you for that question. And um, I think that um, can Canadians should feel confident in so many ways about getting vaccinated. Um, as the Prime Minister said, this is the key uh, to help us uh, get through this pandemic is to get vaccinated. I think that it is hard for people to understand um, evolving science and evolving data. That's what's been so difficult for so many people throughout this pandemic. But I think I am very heartened that the National Advisory Committee on Immunization is taking the data that we're gathering in real time into account and evolving the advice based on that. We all want transparency. We all want that the data is carefully analyzed as we're going along. That doesn't make it easy for people to understand, but um, I think that that's a really important principle and that as benefits and risks are weighed, um, these parameters could shift over time and we can depend on NASI and our chief medical officers have across Canada to take all of that into account as they provide vaccines to everyone. We will keep learning as we go and incorporate any surveillance information, for example, that we have on a serious adverse events. And NASI, I think what I heard from the chief medical officers is that they're very uh, grateful for NASI for providing them with the risk benefit framework upon which they will incorporate uh, the viral vector vaccines such as AstraZeneca and Janssen. And they will um, serve the population with the best advice as they're rolling out their implementation program. Um, but I think that we all have to understand that everyone is trying to provide the best information in order for everyone to make a decision. What I've also heard from Chief Medical Officers is that there is no doubt in their minds as they're experiencing a very significant resurgence in um, COVID-19 and seeing ICUs build up and seeing uh, death still occurring across the country, that the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, has really saved lives and that the vaccine has done what it was designed to do. And that the longer you wait to get vaccinated, the longer that you're not protected. Having said that, they too will take advice from NASI and others and evolve not only as our data uh, evolves on the benefit and risk, but also adapting and calibrating as our supplies, uh, for example, the mRNA vaccine rapidly escalates over time. So I think that Canadians should be confident that our public health systems are providing you with their best advice and the, back, and the vaccines um, as they become available. C'est important de, de se sou just une seconde, Ryan. Uh, just a moment, uh, Ryan. I'm going to answer in English. I think all Canadians are anxious to be done with this pandemic. And I think that everyone understands well that vaccination is a critical step in seeing the end of this crisis. Everyone has to be vaccinated as quickly as possible using all the means that we have. But I want to uh, repeat what can it, people know, which is that Health Canada has approved every vaccine that's being used in Canada as being safe and effective. We will always listen to the experts and scientists who make these recommendations to us. But the important thing is to get vaccinated as quickly as possible in the full knowledge that these vaccines are safe and effective, all of them. Follow up, Ryan? Yeah, sir. Right now, uh, Canadians are hearing from NASI, they're hearing from you, they're hearing from Health Canada, and they're hearing from local medical offices of health. And often they're hearing different advice. 
I'm wondering if you think, in retrospect, it, it you know the government should have clarified the communications process so that Canadians aren't getting confused and potentially more vaccine hesitant uh, in the middle of this pandemic. As, as we've pointed out many times, Canada is a big country with very different realities uh, in terms of pandemic, in terms of demographics right across the country. Uh, and every step of the way, uh, we have put out uh, federal recommendations, but also uh, made sure that the provincial authorities, the people closest to the ground, the people uh, understanding the situation and the way forward best, uh, are able to make their recommendations. Um, we also have seen evolving science. These vaccines uh, were developed uh, to be safe and effective uh, in record time, and that is uh, saving millions of lives around the world. Uh, but also because of that, uh, the data continues to roll in, uh, and there's always opportunities to refine or adjust those recommendations, and that's why uh, we're pleased to be able to continue to count on uh, an extraordinary team of experts and doctors. I think that it's important to emphasize that the pandemic is not the same in different areas of the country. And yes, we are continuing to um, send out messages from the federal government level, but we also see that we need to have experts in the various provinces and territories to share what is most appropriate for their citizens. There are geographical variations and demographic variations, and we always have to have confidence in local authorities. That is why we continue to work together. And the underlying principle is that, yes, we are going to um, monitor this and assess as the situation evolves and uh, as new facts become available to us. But we will always put the safety of Canadians uh, at the forefront as a priority. Mr. Michael Couture with Global National, I just wanted to come back on Nasty sort of doubling down on this idea of preferred vaccines. As one of the 1.7 million Canadians who got one of the not preferred vaccines. Uh, I wanted to know what do you think of that, first of all, and second of all, we're hearing from doctors that are saying that what NASI is doing right now is actually dangerous because it's going against public health guidelines. Do you think that NASI still really serves a purpose here? Um, first of all, let me remind everyone that every vaccine administered in Canada is safe and affected, effective uh, as evaluated by Health Canada. The safety of Canadians is first and foremost. And we have seen the tragic impacts of COVID-19 all across the country. And vaccines are uh, one of the key tools to reduce uh, the deaths uh, and the vulnerability of Canadians to COVID-19. That's why uh, we are continuing to recommend uh, to everyone uh, to get vaccinated as quickly as possible so we can get through this, so we can see uh, case numbers uh, drive down and we can end with so many of these restrictions. I am very, very happy that I got uh, my shot uh, and I'm encouraging everyone uh, to get vaccinated uh, because that's what Health Canada and all experts are highlighting is necessary to get through this. Just, sorry, I've got, got to follow. I just want to ask you, um, last week you talked about your Chief of Staff, uh, Katie Telford, as a strong leader when it comes to fighting accusations of misconduct in the military. You said it's because of her leadership that you call yourselves a fem feminist government. So why does it seem like the Liberals at the National Defence Committee are trying to prevent her from testifying? And would you be okay with her testifying? It is unfortunate, but not surprising. Uh, to see Conservatives uh, playing extremely aggressive partisan games with this issue. My focus, our focus as a government, our focus as a country, needs to be on supporting survivors of sexual assault and harassment and recognizing that the systems that have been in place for many years in the military and elsewhere have not given people comfort to come forward, share their stories and demand consequences. That is a failing that uh, we have collectively had, particularly in the armed forces, and it's something that needs to end. We have taken significant measures over the past number of years 
But as we've clearly seen, there is much more to do. And that's why we made announcements last week with uh, Justice uh, Louise Arbour uh, and General Carignan uh, to put in place measures that will make sure that anyone who experiences harassment, assault in the military or anywhere else for that matter in this country has ways to come forward, engage in a process, be supported and know that we are serious about putting an end uh, to the unacceptable culture that has tolerated this for far too long in our military and in other institutions. I think it's so unfortunate to see the Conservative Party playing political games with this issue. We all should be focused on this, and this is what my government and I myself am concentrating on, is to put an end to this culture that accepts harassment and sexual assault in the armed forces and elsewhere. The reality is that too many people who have undergone these unacceptable experiences do not feel supported and don't have the resources and the ability to demand consequences and to share their stories. Yes, we have made improvements over the last few years, but it's not enough. And that is why we announced uh, Madam Justice Arbour and General Carignan's uh, work to set up better support measures for anyone who would have uh, suffered unacceptable behavior. We must ensure that the men and women and, um, who serve in our armed forces are protected in this country. Prime Minister, you've repeatedly come here in this very room and said that the best vaccine to take is the first one offered to you. And based on that advice, 1.7 million Canadians went and got the AstraZeneca shot. Now they learn that that is not necessarily true from, the, from your science advisors, that they, some of them should have waited and waited to take Moderna or Pfizer. What do, you, do you understand how frustrated they are by that? What do you say to them? And what do you say to someone who's got an appointment today to take AstraZeneca and is now maybe thinking that wasn't, isn't the right uh, vaccine for them? On a personal level, I am extremely pleased that I got the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, a number of weeks ago. Uh, it was uh, extremely important to me uh, to be able to protect my loved ones, to protect my family and to do my part uh, to ensure that uh, all Canadians get through this as quickly as possible. And that's the reality. We all want to get through this pandemic as quickly as possible. And that means all of us getting vaccinated as quickly as possible. That uh, is uh, the focus that we have right now. And again, every single vaccine administered in Canada has been judged by Health Canada as being safe and effective. The impacts of catching COVID are far greater uh, and far deadlier, as we've seen across the country, um, than uh, potential side effects, which, although serious, are rare. But I'm not going to get too much into the uh, medical advice, and I'm happy to turn it over uh, to uh, Dr. Tam for that. But the reality is, the way we get through this pandemic is to get vaccinated with whatever vaccine is offered to us as quickly as possible. Teresa. Yes, um, as I've said that um, I can certainly understand why some um, individuals are you know, concerned or getting frustrated as uh, advice uh, appears to be evolving. But that is the nature of science and advice. And I think that Health Canada, as the Prime Minister said, is doing their job. Uh, they just put out, for example, a notice that they are taking an, a, a very um, you know, diligent look at um, all the information about the Janssen vaccine before they uh, release this vaccine for use in the population. So we know that they're doing their job. The National Advisory Committee on Immunization is also doing their job. So while overall benefits and risks are such that benefits might outweigh the risk, 
there are differences in how you look at benefits and risks depending on uh, the disease activity uh, within your jurisdiction or your local community, as well as your own risk in terms of your age or your risk factors. And the local um, public health department also takes into account um, the supply and logistic and uh, other, uh, other operational uh, elements. But I think the bottom line is that everyone should be reassured that the regulator, the experts, and local medical officers of health have all done their work in a synchronized manner to provide the vaccines um, to the communities so that you should trust that the, the vaccine program being offered to you uh, is done with that best knowledge and that information should be provided to everyone to make sure you get the best informed uh, uh, decisions. On AstraZeneca, on Janssen, we will continue to be monitoring the uh, evolution in information. I think for those who received the AstraZeneca vaccine, as I've said, um, in, in the time frame that we're looking at, all medical officers have said it's been a really, really effective vaccine that saved lives. And I expect the National Advisory Com Community Committee on Immunization and the Chief Medical Officers will also look at what is the best advice going forward for those who already received a AstraZeneca vaccine, including any international evolving clinical trials and any domestic uh, expert analysis on uh, that second dose. So I just want to assure everyone that that advice will be forthcoming in time for when people need that second dose. And But again, I reiterate from all chief medical officers that the AstraZeneca vaccine deployed in the middle of a third wave has saved lives and prevented serious illnesses. Hi, Prime Minister uh, Tom Perry, CBC. I'd like to ask you about international travelers coming into Canada. Um, by air, they're being funneled into four airports. They're supposed to quarantine when they land. Uh, some of them aren't, though. Uh, they're taking a fine instead. Um, when we asked PHAC how many people are taking fines, they said uh, it's a, a number above 500, but they couldn't give us an exact number. Also, it seems that travelers arriving in Vancouver and Toronto are getting fined. Travelers arriving in Calgary and Montreal are just walking away without getting fined. So why is it your officials don't seem to know exactly how many people are, walk, are, are opting out of quarantine? Why is it travelers at some airports are being fined and others not? And what are you going to do about that? Uh, thank you, Tom. First of all, let me remind people that when someone arrives in Canada, whether it's through an airport uh, or through a land border, they have to show a three-day PCR test that is negative. They have to uh, get tested on arrival. Uh, they have to uh, get tested again uh, a week into their quarantine. And they do have to quarantine for two weeks at home. Uh, and that is for everyone arriving. On top of that, if you're arriving at an airport, um, you need to do uh, a uh, mandatory government-approved accommodation while waiting for the result of your on-arrival PCR test. Uh, these are all ways of uh, putting in multiple levels and multiple layers to keep Canadians safe from uh, arrivals of a uh, virus uh, in this country and allow us to study and follow up on uh, the statistics, on the uh, sequencing, on the reality of uh, uh, where those challenges are. And, for example, the system uh, clearly showed that in the case of flights from India and Pakistan, there was a higher level of importation uh, of people testing positive on the on-arrival test. Uh, and that's why, based on that data, we were able to uh, shift our posture and suspend those direct flights. Um, when it comes to enforcement, the federal government works hand in hand with uh, local authorities. The local police have jurisdiction, and we've seen that both in Vancouver uh, and in Toronto or in uh, Ontario and BC, uh, the cooperation between the federal government and the local uh, police uh, has uh, been seamless, and we've been able to both collect data uh, and follow up on this. Uh, in uh, other jurisdictions, uh, the arrangements are slightly different with both Quebec and Alberta. Uh, that means we don't have the same access to the data of the local enforcement actions. But like I said, 
Uh, yes, the RCMP and PHAC uh, and others make follow-up calls and are part of the, the, uh, the checking and enforcement of the mandatory two-week quarantine. Uh, but uh, local, municipal and provincial police are also part of that equation and have the full authorities to bring in fines. And uh, we uh, certainly hope that uh, there will be a, a greater access to data that uh, can reassure people that those fines are indeed being applied and enforced everywhere across the country. I think it's important to emphasize that travelers arriving in Canada have to do a test before boarding the plane to demonstrate that they're negative upon arrival. They have to be tested upon arrival as well and then do another test a week later and they must do those two weeks of quarantine. For those arriving by air, they have to wait in an approved hotel by the government until their arrival test comes back negative. We put these measures uh, into place. There are several layers here, not only to prevent the variants arriving in Canada in great numbers, but also to, in order to be able to collect data to better understand what is happening and where the challenges are. For example, what we did with the suspension of flights arriving from India and Pakistan was based on the fact that among the arrival tests, there was a much higher number of positive cases, and therefore we were able to take action. In British Columbia and in Ontario, we are working very closely with local authorities, and we have the data on the penalties that have been handed out. But in Alberta and Quebec, we don't have the same data. We don't have the same partnership, but I know that local authorities and police have all the necessary powers to follow up on this and uh, go after the people who are not obeying the quarantine orders, and there will be consequences. Sexual assault victims and advocates have complained that Liberal MPs have treated them rudely at committee meetings. Will you speak to your caucus about the, their behaviour in committee meetings, and do you think that the rules should need to be reformed to take a more trauma-informed approach? Uh, I think it's important for everyone uh, to uh, take a more trauma-informed approach uh, on dealing with questions of sexual assault and sexual harassment, on providing support for survivors. Uh, our institutions in general, whether it be the Canadian Armed Forces or our Parliament or workplaces across the country, uh, need to do a better job of creating a supportive environment in which people who have experienced uh, unacceptable actions are able to come forward and engage in a process uh, that is going to, um, going to support them and get consequences uh, for uh, inappropriate actions and even further create environments in which uh, those inappropriate actions don't happen in the first place. Uh, we all have to do better. We all need to take this seriously. Uh, and I know it's something that Liberal MPs, like all MPs, uh, want to do a better job of. Every single party uh, seems preoccupied uh, with uh, supporting survivors and making sure that we are improving our systems throughout government. Uh, and I can assure you that the Liberal government uh, will continue to do just that. Bonjour, Mr. Trudeau, Julianne Lapointe. Hello, Mr. Trudeau. Learning that Netflix will be um, exempted from taxes on their services, do you find that fair? And how do you justify that compared to other digital service providers? Answer. Well, we are in a global economy that has greatly changed over the last few years with the arrival of the web giants, particularly uh, who don't pay their fair share of taxes. Every country, like Canada, has made promises to tax these web giants as of January 1, 2022. But our preference would be not to proceed alone, but to align ourselves with other countries in the world so that we 
have a coordinated and harmonized approach. The OECD is currently looking into the details of how to do this, and we will align ourselves ideally with what our international partners are doing. We promised to ensure that the sales tax should apply on subscriptions to Netflix, as we promised in 2019. And we also promised that Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Apple should pay their fair share of taxes to Canada for the services offered here. We're currently working on that. It, this is not a, a simple or easy issue, but uh, if we are in alignment with the rest of the world, we will improve the responsibility um, of these companies to contribute to society and to people's lives and as they make fantastic profits. Recognize that the world is changing and the presence of online giants that haven't paid their fair share of taxes in the countries uh, where they are operating uh, is something that needs to end. That's why we made a commitment uh, to do just that, to bring in a taxation regime for web giants uh, as of January 1st, 2022, uh, on our own if necessary, but ideally in alignment with uh, other like-minded countries. The OECD is working very hard on creating that alignment so that we're able to move forward and we will uh, ideally harmonize with uh, what the rest of the world is doing to make sure that everyone is paying their fair share. Uh, we are moving forward uh, with applying sales tax uh, to Netflix subscriptions to be fair to streaming services that are Canadian. Um, but at the same time, uh, we will continue uh, to look for ways to make sure that uh, companies that are making tremendous profits uh, off of Canadians uh, without paying their fair share of taxes uh, are actually held to account, and uh, that's something we're moving forward on. Thank you. That concludes the time that the Prime Minister has for questions. The ministers and doctors will be around for a few more moments afterwards for questions. We'll get started once the Prime Minister exits. We'll go back to the phones for questions. Operator, over to you. Thank you, merci. The next question is from Marika Walsh from the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking our questions. I, I guess my question would be for Dr. Tam. I, I'm still a bit confused as to what advice you are giving Canadians as they try to square the circle between the same as today on getting the first vaccine that you can get and the advice yesterday that depending on your own personal risk, um, you should wait for uh, a preferred vaccine or an mRNA vaccine. What is, like, how are they supposed to make sense of those two competing directives? Well, I think they are actually, um, you know, uh, approaches that um, actually do converge because what we'll be doing is that they will be doing a lot of work in helping the public understand that the vaccine that they are providing to them has under, already undergone that benefit risk assessment that NASI has laid out, for instance, so that when they are rolling out their program to uh, individual communities, for example, they've already taken into account the fact that um, there's a lot, there may be a lot of COVID-19 activity going on. Uh, that's really important that they, um, they've they taken that into account uh, already. Uh, they've, of course, uh, looked at the um, data as it pertains to any, um, uh, even if rare, um, serious adverse events. They would have also um, taken into account um, their specific circumstances in terms of their access that they're providing to the different populations. So that by the time it gets to individuals and that you're offered the vaccine, I think um, you've already be reassured that the local jurisdictions have done all of that work. 
And nonetheless, it's always part of informed consent that you be provided with all the information that you need to uh, make that decision because all of us are different and have different sets of circumstances. So I don't see them as being different. I just think that um, you know people should be confident in their public health uh, system and that they are being provided uh, with uh, vaccines, knowing that all of that data and analysis and thoughtful thinking and the balancing of benefit and risk has been part of the consideration as vaccines are offered to them. And I do know that, you know, Canadians have been very enthusiastic about getting vaccinated and that they are getting the, the, the information that they need. So I think we need to maintain confidence in that process and provide people with as much information as possible so that they can they can make an informed choice. Uh, but if you're living in PEI, you're probably not exactly the same as if you're living in Toronto, for example. So um, you know, that is being taken into account as vaccine programs are rolling out. Follow up, Marika. Yeah, thank you for that. My follow-up question would be for Minister Anand. Um, it seems um, that maybe some of this confusion is less important, given that the vast majority of the shots that we are getting appears to be only mRNA in the next few months. Can you please provide us um, with some more information about when we are expecting the next deliveries of AstraZeneca and Johnson and & Johnson and what quantities they will be in? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Let me begin with the total number of doses that we expect during the second quarter, and that's actually cumulative, uh, including the first quarter numbers also, 48 to 50 million doses prior to the end of June of all suppliers, and over 100 million doses by the end of September. The majority of the doses, as you have correctly stated, are from mRNA vaccine producers, being Pfizer and Moderna. This month alone, we are expecting at least 9 million doses of those suppliers. And overall, we have procured 44 million doses of Moderna and 48 million doses of Pfizer. In terms of the uh, breakdown of the numbers of all suppliers for uh, this quarter into the end of June, we are expecting 24.2 million doses of Pfizer, between 10 and 12 million doses of Moderna, just over 4 million doses of AstraZeneca, and the 300,000 doses of Janssen that are in the country at the current time, and additional doses to come in June once the manufacturer confirms a delivery schedule with us. In terms of breaking down those numbers even more, uh, for AstraZeneca in particular, as you are aware, we receive AstraZeneca doses from multiple sources. We are expecting to receive a shipment of 655,000 COVAX doses within the next number of weeks. We have been uh, pressing for a precise delivery date for those doses from the COVAX facility. And when we have that, in hand, we will provide it to you. We are also expecting 1 million doses of AstraZeneca under our APA in the month of June. And we are continuing to be in discussions with the United States about the possibility of receiving doses from them under a similar exchange agreement that we had the end of March with them. I want to stress that at the current time, we have approximately 2.3 million doses of AstraZeneca in the country. And prior to the end of June, 
we expect to have almost double that amount. We will continue to press the supplier as well as all other sources for an expedited delivery of AstraZeneca into this country. Thank you. Thank you. And one more call on the phone, please, operator. La prochaine question de Boris Prou, le devoir. La parole est à vous. Oui, bonjour. Good afternoon. Um, I'm sorry to come back onto the same issue, but it's not clear in my mind. You put yourselves in the skin of a person who's not in a province or an area that is hard hit by COVID at the moment and is wondering whether they should take the AstraZeneca vaccine or the Johnson & Johnson right away or wait to get an R um, mRNA vaccine and not worry about blood clots. So would you recommend to this person that A, they wait for the mRNA vaccine or B, take the other one right away? Thank you for the question. That's Dr. New. Perhaps uh, I'll reiterate, but also talk to you about the other aspects. Um, I, it's clear that in several regions of the country, we're in a third wave. It's very serious, I think particularly of Ontario and Alberta, for example, and it's important to use all of the tools at our disposal to fight against COVID-19. We have four authorized vaccines in Canada, well, th three right that we're using at the moment because Janssen hasn't been delivered yet to the country. But with the three vaccines that we are using, including the AstraZeneca, it is clear that uh, with the experience we have on the front lines that these vaccines have saved lives. They're effective. They have been approved by Health Canada and they have prevented serious cases of COVID and deaths. And so for people who have already received one dose of AstraZeneca, I just have a simple message, which is to say thank you. You've done the right thing. You're protected against COVID-19, but you have also protected your family and friends and other members uh, of your community. So that is clear. Now, it's also a scientific issue, uh, as uh, Minister Alon has already said. Minister Anand, rather, um, we will be receiving millions of more doses uh, from Pfizer, at least two to three million doses in the coming weeks. And so this is something that we have to study because we know that in other countries, for example, in the UK, they are wondering if we start with one dose, say, of AstraZeneca to give a second dose of a different vaccine. This is a very important issue, and um, according to the data we have now, the reports are encouraging, but we're still awaiting the results, and we also asked NASI this question, if they could provide some advice or, or at least an expert opinion on this. So I think that this is something that needs to be followed up on. For the moment, I think that for anyone who's already received a first dose, uh, they should wait for the evidence and the recommendations. But uh, for each province and territory, clearly, it's the chief medical officers and um, public health officials who will take into consideration the recommendations of NASI. But they also have more information. They understand well what the context is within their own province and territory and what the situation, uh, the epidemiological situation is on the ground there. This is the best way to use the available vaccines in within their province or territory and uh, according to the supply. And I think that Canadians across the country can have confidence in public health authorities who are working on the vaccine rollout and they should get vaccinated. It's easy. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Question, Dr. New. I don't feel that you've answered concretely uh, to the example of the person who uh, should they 
take the available vaccine or wait. But in any case, I'd like to ask if Health Canada has an opinion on the whole issue of the vaccine passport. We've talked a lot about that during this press conference. Are they going to recommend this kind of passport that would allow people, as I understand it, uh, from abroad to come here or to allow Canadians to travel abroad? Well, thank you for the question. It's not Health Canada uh, that would make that uh, kind of decision. It's us, the Public Health Agency of Canada, that is working on this issue along with um, our counterparts uh, abroad. And so, to me, there are two aspects to this. If we're talking about a passport or a certificate uh, saying that the person's been vaccinated as a requirement to, in order to be able to travel to another country and get into foreign country, other countries, we're very far from that reality, as the Prime Minister has already said, and I agree entirely. Now, he, he said, it's not at all the time to be traveling. In the future, uh, if it's possible, um, yes, it might be important uh, to, be, to, to, to discuss that now. But uh, I don't know if it will become the, the norm. A number of countries are aligning uh, to have a process or a passport that would be the same around the world. So this is a conversation that's ongoing with our counterparts in terms of travel abroad. But here within Canada, there are many issues, and we've already said, I've said at other press conferences that there are ethical considerations, considerations of stigmatization, uh, and, and there are other issues. If we're going to say that we're going to give everyone a vaccination passport who's had one or two doses, even on the at a technical level, we know that after having had two doses, um, no vaccine is 100 percent effective. So it's still possible for a person who's had two doses, um, it might be Pfizer or, uh, or Moderna, that they might still be vulnerable to COVID-19 and um, still able to transmit this virus to others. So there are many issues to study, but we are following the science which continues to evolve, and we will look at the evidence and other along with other countries, we're working on the file. Thank you. For a few more questions, I know we're running a sh bit short on time, so we'll keep our questions and answers hopefully as efficient as possible. Uh, Glenn McGregor, CTV News. Question for Dr. Tam. A, a lot of Canadians were, were tuning in to this today, I think, for some clarity from you after Nassi's remarks. Uh, now you're saying the science is evolving and they aren't given any more clarity on this issue of whether they should or shouldn't take the AstraZeneca shot or wait for an mRNA vaccine. Now you're saying a few moments ago, Dr. Tam, that location is a factor here too. You're saying people in PEI may have a different decision than somebody living in downtown Toronto. Uh, how could anybody now make a decision on whether they should take an AstraZeneca shot, given all these different streams of conflicting advice? Why don't you give some, some clarity on this for that one person? And I asked the Prime Minister this and he didn't answer. I'd like to hear it from you. If someone's got an appointment to take AstraZeneca today, say in North Bay, Ontario, should they go or not? So, um, thank you for the question again. Um, as I said, that um, you know, it's, I can sympathise with people because they find it, you know, hard uh, to follow the evolving advice. But um, you know, I, I think uh, all medical officers of health have taken into account NASI's recommendations, and they're rolling their vaccines according to their assessment of the uh, benefit and risk. So do follow your local public health advice, and so. Follow the advice in terms of if you're if you're uh, if you're asked to take your turn, please do so, um, and line up. I think that's the bottom line. There's still an informed consent process, though. Everyone has the right to that. So go through your informed consent in terms of uh, understanding about the vaccine, your risk of exposure, your risk of severe illness from COVID and the benefits of getting a vaccine and protecting yourself sooner uh, based on the um, um, you know, epidemiology around you. 
What I'm saying is that follow your local public health advice. We've always said that because they've taken into account everything, all the information available, and that they are rolling out the vaccine and in a certain order um, as they are um, expanding their immunization programs. And soon this will escalate pretty fast. So I think that's my advice. Just follow local public health and be confident that everyone in this whole line of, of regulators to experts to local public health have done their job and uh, follow, follow the instructions. And, but it's your right to, of course, um, ask as many questions as you need and take informed uh, consent. Dr. Tam, Mike LeCouture with Global National. I want to ask you about vaccine mixing. Um, other jurisdictions have already approved it before the UK study does come out in June. So I wanted to know where Canada stands on this, especially considering the supply issues uh, that we could be facing with AstraZeneca and Moderna. And what's your advice to people who are already looking, who have already had one shot of AstraZeneca and are already looking ahead to their second dose? That's an excellent question, and, and I think that uh, we're all interested in the um, approach of um, actually mixing different types of vaccines, like a um, mRNA fo following a viral vector vaccine, for example. And uh, we are following that uh, data, NASI is, uh, very closely. And um, chief medical officers have already asked NASI to provide their advice uh, on the mixed schedule before the initial people who got AstraZeneca vaccine is due for their second dose. So I think that, again, watch the space. The best evidence will be taken into account uh, as available. And that, um, you know, we, we may expect that expert advice to come. And certainly the idea is to have it um, before uh, the, those who've received the first dose of vaccine. Science is actually, um, while evolving, um, I think all I can say is that all of the vaccines being used in Canada are targeting the spike protein. And um, so, so I think that um, the science will look towards whether, in fact, uh, um, not, not, not just whether the mix schedule is um, safe, but you may sort of look at whether that's actually an even better um, approach than using exactly the same vaccine for the two doses. Those, those questions uh, remain to be answered, but I think there's a commitment to ensure that those who received the first dose are given advice on the best uh, vaccine to use for the second dose before uh, they, need, um, they need the second dose. Bonjour, Julianne Lapointe. Peut-être une question pour le a question for Dr. New, perhaps. We understand that most Canadians are not health care experts, but now what we're being asked to is that these non-experts decide for themselves whether it's uh, the advantages of being vaccinated with X vaccine is better than taking Y. So isn't there some risk in this of general confusion if these non-experts are being asked to determine for themselves what is the best path to take? Thank you for the question. If I understand your question correctly, you're talking about non-experts. You're talking about the man in the street who must make a, a decision as to which vaccine they're accepting. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Uh, the, the, just the, the man in the street, as, you know, as the people you're talking to today. Answer, yes. Well, as Dr. Tam and I have tried to explain, yes, it's complex. It, it might be difficult for everyone to understand. But uh, with NASI, the uh, committee giving us advice, is a committee with experts in various domains, and they made their statement yesterday concerning the use of the Janssen vaccine, but they also made statements on AstraZeneca and the others, so that is clear. And following that, it's really up to um, public health 
officers in each territory and province. That must take into consideration the recommendations made by the National Advisory Committee on Immunization. But also what uh, epidemiologists feel and, uh, what the, and they have to consider the situation in their respective province or territory. So Dr. Tam responded to that as well here today. If the man in the street has a, an appointment already for a vaccination, they should ensure that the public health authorities in their area have consulted and looked at what the supply is and with all of the tools at their disposal of the three currently available vaccines in Canada, because the fourth Janssen is not yet available here, uh, clearly the uh, vaccine that will be taken, I mean, we should also ask questions about it. We need to take enlightened decisions. But I think that uh, with a great deal of confidence, the average person can accept credible information according to their local health authorities and accept whatever vaccine is pr proposed to them. So if it's AstraZeneca, we've had long discussions uh, and we've spoken with transparency about all of the information that's available. Hi, it's Tom Perry from CBC. I just want to ask Dr. Tam, just so that I'm crystal clear on this, is your advice right now for people who got the first dose of AstraZeneca, is your advice right now for their second dose to go ahead and get AstraZeneca, or is it right now to wait and see whether it makes more sense to take Pfizer, Moderna, a different vaccine for a second dose? Yes, um, I think the current recommendation is um, to use the same vaccine for um, the series for a multi-dose vaccine. But um, just to indicate that um, there will be further advice forthcoming um, on um, that second dose uh, based on the evolving uh, science uh, as well. So I think uh, what I said was essentially um, you know, there will be further clarification and advice uh, prior to individuals getting the second dose and that uh, we should watch that space. Thank you. And that concludes today's press conference. You have been listening uh, to D Dr. Teresa Tam, the Chief uh, Medical Officer for Canada, along with her deputy, Dr. Howard New, uh, as well as uh, many others. Uh, let's bring in the CBC's David Cochran and Hannah Thibodeau. Uh, David, uh, let's start with you, because uh, let's start with all of this around uh, the, the preference by NACI. That came out yesterday. The National Advisory Committee.